Welcome to Journey with Lay Podcast. We discuss leadership, culture, and how to take your business to new heights. Your host, Lei Wang, is an adventurer, motivational speaker, and executive coach. Join us each week to learn how you and your team can reach your highest aspirations. Now, let's get started with the show. Hey, everyone. Lei Wang here, host of this show. This episode is brought to you by Journey with Lei where I help business leaders create a culture of excitement, build a highly engaged teams, and consistently perform at their peak. Start tapping into your powers of excitement and take your career and your business to new heights today. Go to journeywithlay.com or email hello at journeywithlay.com. Today, our special guest is Andrew Jacobus. Andrew has been a senior executive in the corporate well-being space for over six years and previously had over 20 years of experience in analytics, human capital, and strategic workforce planning. Andrew is a vice president at the Limeade Institute. Limeade is a corporate well-being and employee experience company that served global Fortune 500 companies and government institutions. Last year, I was fortunate to work with Andrew to help him navigate his career transition. Today, I'm so excited to have Andrew on our show to share his insight on what corporates can do to help improve employees' well-being. Hi, Andrew, thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, Leigh. Thank you for the the kind introduction. I feel very fortunate to be here with you as well. Yeah, I'm so excited to have you here today. So first of all, would you please just help our audience understand the kind of role you play in the corporate well-being space? Sure, sure. So my title is Vice President of Limeade Institute. Limeade Institute is a uh, research uh, part of our organization. It's really about the science of what we what we call the science of care. Uh, I work with uh, researchers, folks uh, with PhDs who have academic backgrounds, uh, as well as folks who are practitioners in the area of well-being and employee experience, people who have managed these programs for their organizations. We also have some data science. Uh, we have a, a nice blend of what I like to call the spectrum of insights. And our responsibility is to try to establish um, truths and points of view based on science, based on psychology, um, based on behavioral understanding uh, in order to help improve for our clients and their employees, their total workforce well-being. Uh, and and we, we look at that as um, part of the employee experience. You know, how you feel about your work, how you feel about your organization is as important to your well-being as taking care of yourself mentally, taking care of yourself physically, eating well, et cetera. So I like to say we're, we're here to help our clients, help their employees be healthier, happier, and more productive. That sounds, that sounds great. And uh, no, actually, well-being sounds very simple, but if, if people get a chance to read any of the Gallup reviews, the survey or news report can see actually a lot of complicated things in it. So I know after two years of battling with the pandemic, more and more people really learn to prioritize their health and well-being. And more and more corporations, institutions are investing in their employees' well-being. So I know you have the insights group. So what has institute learned about employees' needs in this area? Well, I, I think it's complicated. I actually delivered a presentation on this in our company's um, annual conference, uh, which we're still, you can actually, if anybody is interested, there's uh, presentations, you can go to limemade.com and, and access the conference um, webinars, but it's not as easy as it maybe used to be. Like your point that the pandemic has made things quite difficult uh, for people in a lot of different areas of work. Um, work and life have become more integrated, and the demands on people uh, in their lives, uh, certainly with, with the pandemic, with social unrest, now with the war in Ukraine, 
um, the level of stress that people are experiencing, the level of increased anxiety, both they and their families are dealing with has become much more acute. And um, organizations have done a good job, I think, of adjusting to remote work for people who work at desks, for instance. But um, the solutions don't suit everybody. And, and what I think this has done is surface to organizations that um, there's, there's never really been an easy one size fits all, but they've been able to establish policy. They've been able to establish procedures and kind of steer things in relatively controlled ways for large proportions of their workforce. What they're encountering now is that people need care by their organizations in order to care for themselves and for their families and those around them. Um, and it needs to be more personal, which means it's a much more complex set of demands on the organization. It's a much more complex set of demands on managers. Um, you know, there's a greater need for empathy. Uh, so anyway, I say it is complicated because some things are working, some things are evolving, some things work for some people and some things don't. Um, and organizations really need to be flexible uh, in, in order to try to uh, tackle some of the problems that we're hearing. Uh, you, you mentioned the Gallup survey. Um, that was a, a very recent result that uh, they released. You know, people had felt through the pandemic and all the way into late 2021 and one, excuse me, 2021, that their organizations were taking care of them. We actually saw a spike in those results in the question of, I feel like my company takes care of me. Um, up into the 40s, nearly half of the workforce felt that way. And then just in the last couple of months, that number has tumbled to fewer than one in four people feel like their company is doing a good job wow. taking care of them. Yeah. So do you mind going in a little bit more detail about what kind of support do employees need from their organization? Yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to, I mean, I could go for hours on that question. <laughs> the kind of support yeah, that, that they need. The layman's language we can understand. It really, it really, it varies, but I'll say that the main things that they need are, um, one, they need care. They need to have faith in their organization. They need to have trust in their organization. So what companies have to do is try to establish a more psychologically safe workspace. Uh, one in which they are accountable to their employees. They actually listen well, respond well. They, they breed empathy throughout their culture um, in ways that are you know, supportive of, of what people are saying they need. Um, they have to be flexible. Uh, we are not seeing an end to the great resignation, so to speak, the great transition, as we'll call it. Um, they've got to be able to be patient with people and, and give them space to um, one, feel like they've got a future, they've got a career if you want to retain them Two, welcome them into the organization and give them time to adjust uh, because of the churn, because of the flux. So many organizations are are um, in, a, in a state of, of constant uh, evolution, so to speak, um, with a lot of learning going on. The learning is another key thing they've got to pay attention to. They've got to be able to give people uh, the support they're looking for. One of the key things that that turned up in this last year that people are looking for is actual development um, opportunity. You know, for a long time, um, in the last 20 years, organizations have been maybe providing a little bit of money to people, but giving them the responsibility for their own development. Uh, that needs to change. They've got to be able to help develop people and give them both skills development and career development uh, in order to help them, one, feel cared for in their work well-being, uh, but also, two, feel like they've got um, some alignment uh, with their own personal purpose and with their organizational purpose. So I'm getting at some of these things that are, I think, cultural. The last thing I'll say that companies need to do is do their absolute best to take care of their managers. Some of our own research uh, with Limeade and Tiny Pulse, which is a company that Limeade acquired last year, shows that some of the highest, um, that the highest increases in stress, decreases in engagement, um, decreases in feeling cared for, fall into the categories of caretakers, and that includes managers in the organizations. Um, you know, the Gallup uh, research showed that people who are, are front lines in hospitals as caretakers are also among those who have seen the biggest declines in engagement um, and the highest risks for burnout. So helping managers 
one, take care of themselves and two, take care of their people with constant support, training, development, and space to be able to take care of people and not just necessarily do their own work and take care of people um, is also critical for organizations to address. And there are a lot of different ways to going about that. Uh, it's, it's not as if you're going to be able to say, okay, let's just go turn on this, this, well, this well-being solution, this learning solution, um, and tell people about them. It takes active listening. It takes active focus. It takes leadership support, leadership involvement uh, in order to make those things actually um, land and, and stick and work for their workforce. That's great. So, so that also implies that people of different type of jobs, different generations probably have slightly different needs. Is that right? It is. It is. It's funny. Um, that's back to the point I made about um, needing to be flexible. Uh, mm-hmm. It's funny. Flexibility was another one of those big things that everybody should, says that they want and why they're leaving their jobs is they're looking for more flexibility, uh, where some organizations maybe haven't been as flexible and are, for instance, trying to force people back into the office um, now that we're seeing mass mandates lifted and so on. Um, flexibility means uh, a lot to people of a certain generation. And we dug into some of the research uh, in in my presentation, I I touched on how the the interest in flexibility is definitely directly correlated generationally. Um, On LinkedIn, uh, people who clicked on flexibility themed posts uh, by generation, people in the generation Z and in the millennials uh, were much more likely than their own averages to click on a post in LinkedIn if it mentioned flexibility. So they're very interested in that stuff. People in Generation X, uh, people in the boomer generation, inversely related interests. They were actually less interested in reading up on LinkedIn posts about flexibility and on company posts about flexibility. Um, So there are generational differences, but there are also things that generations have in common. And one of the things I mentioned earlier was the need for mental health support, mental health resources. Uh, That's part of what the training and development needs to be. It's also part of what people need to be able to uh, access through their benefits, not just employee assistance programs, but life services, coaching, um, access to personal care and support for that and time and availability for that. Um, that's universally appreciated. So um, you know, people who indicated in uh, this, this LinkedIn study uh, that they want more mental health content, it was uh, at least 30% more from the boomer generation all the way up to 66% more in Gen Z. But everybody felt like they need more mental health support and mental health content available to them. So, um, you know, there are also complexities, not just between generations, but between job types. You know, we talk about, uh, and I think the bias is to think about people who have been forced to remote work and work at desks, um, but it's a lot different for frontline workers. You know, companies are paying more attention to that now. There's great research from Microsoft on trying to help people on the front lines with more accessibility, more tools, be able to help infuse well-being. Um, more into the the flow of work for those people on the front lines. But frontline workers are another group that has um, felt differently about uh, and and actually believes differently about the level of trust and trust and care available to them from their organizations and their leaders. Wow, that sounds a lot. So so give us some... It's the tip of the iceberg of complexity, frankly. I know. Yeah, so maybe give us some hope, like... What are some practices you see that are working for many of those companies? Yeah, I mean, um, there's a lot, you know, employers have tried uh, offering flex work, uh, giving people flexible schedules, which can work for people who aren't working in a restaurant environment, for instance, right? But giving people flexible schedules helps them um, take time out to care for their families, take time out to care for themselves, get work done at their own pace and deal with the demands of life when they're actually working at home. Um, That's been well received. Um, But as I mentioned, you know, that doesn't necessarily apply to people in all different job types and uh, folks in the supply chain out in the field. That doesn't necessarily work as well uh, because of the demands on those roles. 
some organizations are actually scheduling calendar breaks from work. They're putting shutdowns on the calendar more often than, uh, than maybe they previously would have in particular industries. Um, you know, a lot of organizations tried shutting down at the end of the year uh, and giving everybody time off and not necessarily taking that out of their personal time off. Um, that's great. But again, it doesn't necessarily apply to everybody. It doesn't necessarily work for folks who are in security in office buildings, for instance. Um, so some of the things that they do are uh, a little bit more cultural. Uh, giving, I, I think, the findings from um, recent Gallup work shows that companies that have been successful at retaining people, keeping them more highly engaged, go back to some of the original fundamentals of, uh, of engagement. You know, showing visible leadership support and leadership involvement in, in the initiatives, but also being accessible uh, and in the listening uh, and the communications with people, um, open and, and transparent communications, especially listening really well, uh, is also very important. But having the, the executives and, and leaders in an organization, because um, leadership exists on all levels, uh, actually actively participate in some of these things. So taking time off, showing that they're taking time off. I've had people in my own organization take a week off and, and disconnect their devices, actually uninstall applications from their phones so they can commit to time with their families. That's showing that you're actually living it and breathing it, you know, not having any kind of uh, a duality. Some other things that they're trying out that um, are, are, you know, still works in progress, shorter work weeks, um, having uh, meeting free days, giving people again time and space uh, around flexibility um, and adding more you know I mentioned mental well-being adding more to the services that they have uh, available to people you know investing more in benefits that are available to them I think that's one of the things that a lot of people who have gone to new organizations are seeing is is a better benefits um, overall uh, set of um, source resources available to them uh, across a wider spectrum that has better company coverage than it may have in the past when organizations were dialing back as the high cost of healthcare kept increasing. So again, I could go on for, for hours about some of the solutions that uh, organizations have been trying and a lot of it's landing, um, but it's going to be an evolution. Companies are going to need to keep being flexible and keep evolving as we return to work, as we move into the next stage of COVID, you know, with new variants and discovery of, uh, of um, hopefully new, new treatments and so on. Um, and as, as people come out of this, there's going to be a different set of expectations of the employment contract. So my advice to companies is definitely to continue to stay flexible um, don't feel like your investments have to be in the long term, you know, be flexible with what you're investing in too. And, and uh, you know, continue to listen to people uh, and be able to read and react to that. Great. Thank you. And I'm also curious. So are there any like, research on startup? Because I know startup doesn't have the luxury of like it can take forever to do something there. Uh, lot of burnout in startup because they have to do so many things, wear so many hats, work so long hours. Are there any research on that? Don't have a, a lot of research on it recently, although I have seen that um, some of the highest levels of turnover are actually from former startups lately. Um, I think people who go to a startup go in with the expectation that they are going to be working hard and they're rewarded with longer term um, equity, so to speak. In, in the outcomes. Um, and a lot of people go to startups because they are really, really fully invested in the mission and they're willing to make sacrifices. Um, you know, small organizations like that are also starting out without deep policies and deep investments and other things where they feel like, you know, there would be a, a loss if they change something. They can actually be even more flexible uh, with people in order to help meet them where they need to be. Still potentially gonna be very hard work for people who go to work, at startups, but they're also thinking more about the mission and the vision, and they're more personally aligned, and they're willing to think longer term than companies um, who maybe have been in place for a while. Uh, one of the statistics, I'm not going to get the numbers right, but um, the level of turnover from uh, companies like uh, Tesla 
and uh, Amazon, uh, some of the high techs that have a, a lot of value and a lot of history and, and um, you know, credibility and, and reputation for being a startup and an innovative company and fast moving and fast paced, their turnover is, is triple what it is from startups uh, recently. I think you probably saw it in the Gallup research as well. Oh, that's a surprise. People will think for now that the startup should be more. That's interesting. It could be. It's not to say that it's not a risk, um, but I think people who are in these organizations and running these organizations are acknowledging it. We're all living this together, regardless of what companies we work for. Uh, and you know, in smaller firms, it's easier to hear what everybody has to say. Right, and also expectation are different. People go in to start out with a different mentality. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, and I, I like that you mentioned that leaders in the company are actually the caretaker in the companies. So they have more complicated needs, more than just a simple personal development. So how does company support leaders to be an employee, to be a caretaker, and to yeah. work as a leader? It's uh, it's it's not easy, and it's so the, the emphasis is more on managers throughout the organization, not necessarily leaders the way we traditionally think of leaders who have high levels of responsibility and large organizations. Although they are also dealing with it, they are managers themselves. Um, but it's managers who are closer to the front lines, who maybe have higher spans of control, who have more people who are necessarily dealing with work and life struggles, um, you know, and don't necessarily have all the same resources that leaders might have available to them. Uh, and, and what companies are are trying to do are, um, one, helping them feel care, cared for. And what they should be doing is giving them training uh, and giving them space, actually taking some of the individual contributor workloads off of the managers and, and letting them delegate, giving them a little bit of space, giving them support, uh, but also letting them have the time and the training to understand and be empathetic. Um, you know, and this is this is not necessarily an easy thing for you know people who are my way or the highway. Uh, the demand on them is to be much more empathetic now. Uh, otherwise, they're going to lose their people. So training people on some of those, I don't want to call them soft skills, but um, those personal skills uh, first helps. Um, secondly, helping balance with with workloads. You know, there's got to be a lot of uh, saying no where they can invest more in terms of the talent and the technology to get more done. So if you're overworking employees, there's stuff that needs to come off of their plates, giving managers the, the leeway uh, to be able to do that, the autonomy to be able to shut down some work in order to keep their people from getting burned out. Uh, is also uh, a key thing. And I mentioned that earlier, leaders walking the talk by saying, okay, we're not going to do this right now because if we do, it's too much and uh, we're going to burn out our people. It's not going to create a competitive advantage for us. Um, and the cost of burnout is is very high. Uh, it, it, people think that people working uh, all hours and, and nonstop is great productivity. It actually decreases from the bottom line. Yeah. And you mentioned like coaching is one of the tools companies can use to help their leaders. And I know last year I was really grateful I had the opportunity to work with you during your career transition. So mm -hmm. would you want to share from your personal experience, how does coaching help leaders on their professional development and take care of their well-being? Yeah, well, this is one of those things that I've looked for uh, in every job I've taken is what kind of executive coaching is available to us. And uh, with you, I was I was very fortunate to get to work with you and step outside of my own work responsibilities and look at things in a much more um, objective and pragmatic way. Um, so I, I, I think providing coaching to uh, managers, providing coaching to leaders in the, in the organizations is available. Um, so I missed this point earlier, but one of the things that companies are offering in terms of mental well-being is, um, is coaches to be able to support people uh, with how they're, they're handling their own work and how they're handling taking care of themselves. But, you know, with you, I think the benefit of coaching for me was um, really being able to objectively step back and look at the environment and look at myself and my work. In, in a different way, through a different lens, you know, having someone like you who was patient 
um, you know, and, and, and leading a conversation in a gentle way, um, letting things kind of develop organically really helped me see and, and focus on what was important. One from the career search perspective, um, you know, as I evolved and, and really was able to more tightly focus on what's important to me. I found a great job with Limeade that that very much fits within my own personal values. And um, it helps me, you know, feel like I'm making a difference in the world uh, with people, um, which is great. But then more to the point of once I'm, I'm in this new environment, what are the things I need to do to really build my foundation uh, and get straight? You know, I, I, I my plan, um, that I got to develop with you in terms of looking at the organization from, from classic prisms like strengths and weaknesses and opportunities and threats, uh, but also more thoughtful perspectives in terms of uh, assessment of priorities, you know, looking at priorities both from a, uh, you know, a work objectives perspective, but also a culture and a values perspective, um, I think gave me a real great start, gave me a great leg up. Uh, as I was going through this transition. And if I'm extrapolating that, I think that can help people regardless of where they are, whether or not they're looking at a job change, if they're just looking at trying to deal with, um, you know, the work and, and it's, it's, own, it's evolution on a month to month, um, quarter to quarter basis, you know, uh, as, as changes are happening in the world and changes are happening with companies and they're revisiting policies and so on. Coaching can help people, um, you know, be objective, be mindful, uh, be thoughtful and, and um, adapt uh, better than necessarily if they didn't have um, good coaches to support them along the way. Yeah, thank you for your kind of words. I think that's what cool. made me feel very rewarding to work with leaders because helping leaders to have better professional development, better well-being, also help them to take care of their employees, help make the whole environment better. So thank you so much for the opportunity working with me. Well, and thank you for working with me too, of course. I appreciate it. Thank you. And also, uh, I know Lamed is a corporate well-being and employee experience company. And, but somehow, like, I think not only, I bet probably not only me don't fully understand it, the line between well-being and employee appearance, like yep. how that related and how the difference. I, I think I, that's a good question. And I think the two are coming together. So the historical thinking, you know, employee experience isn't a new concept, but it's been historically supported through kind of talent solutions, through HR strategies, uh, people strategies that um, focus on the work side of things, but the employee experience is really all encompassing. You know, what, what happens from when you get up and start your day to when you go to bed at night, um, especially these days. And, you know, having a, a, a so, so Limeade's mission, we, we call it, um, you know, we, we are trying to transform work into a source of positivity, energy, humanity, and purpose. Um, which helps employees with their own well-being in that they're feeling cared for, but they're also aligned from a purpose perspective. That makes the employee experience better. And so our solutions are, we have a technology, we have uh, you know, a platform that our, our clients use, um, that our, their, their employees use both on their mobile phones uh, as well as on their desktops that just infuses uh, well-being support into their day. Um, you know, and, and for me, the, the strategy of infusing well-being in the flow of work, which is really where we're going, uh, is, is the best way to think about, you know, people need to be able to um, feel cared for, taking care of themselves, take care of their work and have it all kind of blend together in a relatively seamless way. So our products are able to give people ways to feel better about themselves, ways to take better care of themselves from all dimensions of health and well-being, uh, but also help them in their flow of work, help them feel more engaged in their work, help them get better aligned, help them, um, you know, be their best selves on the job as well as, as in life. So, um, you know, how do we do that? It's, it's one through the platform that the employers use, uh, that their employees use, but we also have uh, a lot of services. You know, we work directly with our customers, the employers, on the strategies to establish strong cultures of care, 
to deliver best practices to them to help them uh, essentially take care of their employees in a, in a strong, um, well-supported way and, and in which the employees actually feel like they're more cared for. You know, I mentioned that, that stat that fewer than one in four people uh, feel that way. Uh, the need is, is still as strong as ever uh, to be able to give people the tools to, one, do their work better, two, um, feel more cared for. I know I've, I've kind of iterated on some of how that needs to go about um, with organizations and, and, you know, another one of the services that we're offering is, is manager support. Uh, we're developing, you know, energy workshops. We're developing um, the support uh, of empathy, you know, actually putting tools in the hands of our clients uh, to be able to act on what's going to help them establish that culture of care so to speak. Now, again, I, I probably sound like a sales pitch at this point. I don't want to go <laughs> too deep into it. But again, I really, I, I, I believe in the mission and I believe in, in how we're doing this. And we're seeing some really good things happen with a, a pretty large client base. And uh, we're only trying to grow it. Yeah, I love the mission. So is it possible to give us a concrete example, like say as an employee or as a manager in my day-to-day -day interaction with your platform or with your app, Mm -hmm. Like, how does that, like, say, you remind me about doing something or does that, like, give me a guidance on certain situations? Well, it's it's pretty cool stuff. I don't want to sell, um, you know, a ton. I don't want to overstate and, and kind of preview too much of the, the secret sauce, but some really interesting things. We're working on an integrating um, the Limeade well-being content and uh, nudges and personalization um, using artificial intelligence. We've got machine learning based models that are running and constantly able to figure out and deliver to people gentle nudges, for instance. Um, it may be, hey, you've had too many meetings, and this is an integration with Microsoft uh, Teams and Viva. Um, hey, maybe you needed to schedule some time for a break, um, you know, in your day. Um, there's also listening tools. We have, uh, you know, great, great work, great capabilities uh, for supporting the relationships between coworkers and their managers and coworkers and their, their peers, uh, something we call Cheers for Peers. It's a you know, hey, give a shout out to somebody today, you know, don't don't pass up an opportunity to, you know, help encourage a coworker and, and give them a boost in their day. Um, it actually helps with the mental well-being. It helps with motivation to feel um, recognized and appreciated uh, by peers or by leaders in the organizations. And our tools help people do that more organically, more easily um, than, you know, they may otherwise think to like, oh, it's the end of the week. I need to, you know, go back and look at um, all the great things and, and give a shout out. And, you know, if that's the way you do it at the end of every week, essentially people will get to, you know, tune it out or take it for granted. Um, so being able to surface these things and these opportunities um, more in the day to day at the right time and, and meeting people where they are in their flow of work is, um, I think, really cool new stuff that's, uh, that's happening now um, and is also going to continue to evolve uh, down the pipe. Um, you know, not just for people who work at a desk, but also being able to reach people in their flow of work, regardless of what kind of, of work they have. Um, if they're drivers delivering packages, if they're, you know, working on the front lines, um, you're going to see more and more of that kind of stuff uh, be available to people more seamlessly, uh, you know, all around the world. It's pretty great stuff. Yeah, that sounds fun. So I don't try, don't try to poke the secret, but I kind of wonder... Do you mind to share like what are some organizational approaches or technology innovations you see that will make a difference in the next 12 to 18 months that's coming? Uh, that's, you know, that's a good question. I gave a couple of examples of things that are both happening now and that are going to continue to evolve. Um, you know, I, I think what we're going to see is continued evolution in what the work paradigm is. Um, we're going to be able to help organizations reset their visions or strategies on how to take care of people, how to engage more with a flexible workforce, uh, not just, you know, people who are working in a traditional employment relationship, they're getting paid, they're getting benefits and so on, but um, taking better advantage of uh, folks on what would traditionally be considered a contract basis or a gig basis. Um, you know, crowdsourcing uh, things uh, a little bit differently. The, the crowdsourcing of, of ideas has been 
wonderful, the development of technology through, um, you know, widely available applications has been uh, fantastic. I think organizations are going to be able to do more of how they take care of their employees through um, what you would call, now I wouldn't, maybe you wouldn't say clearing houses, but in better integration and unification of technologies um, to make it easy for people to, you know, quickly search up something that I need and automatically have an app spit up uh, for them to be able to use, uh, regardless of if it's personal or if it's work related, um, and not have to go through some of the clunky old mechanisms of, well, I only have this BI application to be able to use, or I only have to, you know, these tools to be able to develop uh, new software with. Um, so, just a few examples of uh, of how that level of flexibility and greater integration and unification of technologies will. Uh, will enable people to do their work uh, with more flexibility. Um, I'm, I'm very excited about those kinds of things. Yeah, that sounds very exciting. Thank you for sharing so much insight and advice today. So if we can just summarize, we'll say the three key steps for the leaders today to better take care of their employees. What are the three? Oh, there are so many things that leaders need to do to take care of their employees, but um, I, I would summarize it as um, one, stay flexible. And, you know, there, there really, there are kind of the, the, the three Fs I like to bundle things into, you know, fundamentals and, and uh, flexibility and future. You know, flexibility and future are, are kind of well tied together, but um, staying flexible, not only in expectations of employees in work schedules in um, priorities uh, but also in establishing policies and establishing change you know be nimble and adaptable and adjustable with the way you enable your employees um, and be flexible in terms of um, offerings and and expectations to be able to level the playing field for everybody you know a lot of organizations have a lot of different kinds of workers um, and you need everyone to feel cared for equally. So flexibility in those regards are really important. Uh, I think the um, you know, fundamentals involve what I mentioned earlier, the, the key things that drive engagement, you know, better leadership support, trust, um, actually building psychological safety, you know, giving people comfort in being vulnerable, comfort in feeling like they have what they need to do their jobs um, is also pretty critical. Um, being able to listen well and communicate well with transparency and accountability. Those are all real fundamentals. Uh, and then focus on the future. You know, the, the personal employee experience is going to continue to evolve. Um, people, I, what I really worry about is that people are, are right now worrying about trying to get back to normal, trying to recover from this pandemic, trying to go back to the old way of doing things. Um, there's no normal. And, you know, even the phrase, the new normal, I don't like that. I don't think that's true. There's, there's the next normal, but normal is complex and normal is a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So be ready to be flexible and keep adjusting over time as, as the future happens. Those are, those are my few recommendations as takeaways. Thank you. Yeah, I like that. There's no normal, not even new normal. It's like the one we say, oh, is the weather normal? Well, weather always oh, change. There's no normal. Same as our life, our work life, work life balance. So yeah. So thank you so much, Andrew. There's a lot of thing to digest, and I'll try to make sure putting as much detail as possible in the show notes. So audience, don't worry about it if you didn't keep up with all the details. So thank you, Andrew, and thank you everyone for tuning in. Thank you, Leigh. It's uh, it's been wonderful to be here. I really appreciate it, and thank you all for listening. Thank you. Have an exciting day and I'll see you next week. Thank you for listening to Journey with Lay. What's your most valuable takeaway from today's episode? What is one step that you are inspired to take? Start tapping into your power of excitement and become the leader you are always meant to be. If you dare to dream it, you can achieve it. Go to journeywithlay.com or email hello at journeywithlay.com. We'll see you again next week.